display for all to see. You are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin.
Now, last weekend, we were in chapter number 24, and, and we talked about a major transition that happened in Paul's experience. Because in chapter 24, he, he was arrested in chapter 21, but in chapter 24, he transitioned from the Jewish legal system to the Roman court. And so in chapter 24, he stood trial before the Roman governor, Felix. And when you come to the end of chapter 24, we discovered that Felix left Paul in jail for two years, even though he had done nothing wrong. At the end of chapter 24, verse number 27, it says, after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's office. So at the end of chapter 24, Felix, who is the Roman governor in Judea, has been recalled to Rome. There's a new governor who's coming into the region who's going to... Um, uh, be in power there for Rome, be the governor. And his name is Porcius Festus. You might just call him Festus. And if you're old enough to remember Gunsmoke, you might remember him by Festus and Gunsmoke. Now I'm thinking he didn't sound exactly like Festus sounded in that show. But this is the new Roman governor whose name is Festus. 
in chapter 25, Paul is going to stand trial before Festus as well. And by the way, notice the injustice here, because by the time you get to the end of chapter 25 and into chapter 26, Paul will have had a trial. He will have had to give an account of himself before four different authorities. The first one, Claudius Lysias, who was the Roman tribune, the Roman governor, or the Roman commander. He said of Paul, he's done nothing wrong. But he then transferred him to the governor, Felix. Felix put Paul on trial. At the end of that trial, Felix said, he has done nothing wrong. But he left him in jail for two years. Two years later, Porcius Festus comes into office. He will stand trial. Paul will stand trial before Festus. And guess what Festus will say? He has done nothing wrong. But he leaves him in jail still. And by the time you get into chapter number 26, he will stand trial before the fourth authority, King Herod Agrippa. And guess what King Herod will say? He has done nothing wrong. And yet, after four trials, being found innocent four times, Paul remains in Roman custody. And you might say, in fact, you would be right in saying, it's absolutely unjust. It's not fair. Well, can we agree together? Life is not always fair. Amen? Even when you seek to serve the Lord, injustices can happen, and it will not always be fair. But here's what we've learned. God didn't promise us that the road that we would walk would be easy or even fair, but he did promise us that he is always at work, even in those difficulties, accomplishing his will. And this is the great hope that Paul has. Even though he's languishing in jail unjustly, he knows that God is in control. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of leapfrog over chapter 25. We're going to survey it real quickly, look at what happens there. But we're going to get on into chapter number 26 and take our text uh, from that chapter. Let me just begin with you in chapter 25 and, and, and show you what's happening. Verse number 1 says that when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea up to Jerusalem. Now, this is just protocol, okay? So Felix leaves office, Festus comes into office, he comes from Rome, he establishes his capital in Caesarea, which is on the coast. Then after a few days, he goes up to Jerusalem. He would have done that because Jerusalem is the centerpiece, the most populous or populated area of his region of responsibility. So he goes to introduce himself and to establish his authority in the region. As soon as he arrives in Jerusalem, he's met by the high priest and the rulers of the Jewish people. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him, desiring a favor against him, that he would send for Paul and have him brought up to Jerusalem so they could have a trial there. This would be trial number 5. So now think about it. How long has Paul been sitting in jail down in Caesarea? Two years. The very first thing that happens when the new governor comes into power is that he goes up to Jerusalem and the Jews, who hate Paul and want him dead, the first thing on their minds is they say, hey, let us tell you about that prisoner, Paul, that you've got down there. Maybe you haven't heard about him yet, but we want you to bring him up to Jerusalem so that we can have a trial, trial number five for him. Well, the reason they want him brought up there, verse number three is very, very clear, is that they were going to lie in wait, do you see it, verse three, in order to kill him. They wanted him brought out of the jail cell so that somewhere along the journey they would be able to kill him. The conspiracy, the plot to murder Paul is still going on after two years. He is so hated by the Jews. Well, by God's sovereign protection and and overseeing of Paul's life, he doesn't allow Paul to be brought up to Jerusalem. Festus says, no, if you want to see him on trial before me, you need to come to Caesarea. That's what happens beginning in verse number 4. He stands trial before Festus. Now look at chapter 25 and verse number 13. Verse 13 says, and after certain days... King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. Enter into the narrative, enter into the text, King Herod Agrippa. And this would have been a matter of protocol. 
Herod the, being the king of Judea, the king of the Jews. Now the Roman governor comes into town, and so the king, what is a matter of protocol and respect, would have come to Caesarea to greet him and to welcome him to the region and to pledge his cooperation in the governance of the kingdom. And so he comes in verse number 13 and uh, meets with Festus. Festus tells him about Paul, and he says uh, that I want to hear about this man. Now, let me take just a minute for those of you who are history buffs and make sure you understand who the Herods are. Go like this if you've ever read about Herod in your Bible. Have you done that, right? So you know, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, you'll hear about King Herod. Well, it's, he's always called King Herod, but it's more than one. In fact, in the New Testament, there are five different Herods that are referred to. Now, the most famous one is King Herod the Great. And I've told you about King Herod the Great before. King Herod the Great was called the Great, not because he was a great man. In fact, he was a horrible man. He was about as bad as you could be. But he was called King Herod the Great because of his great visionary uh, vision and engineering prowess and architectural uh, design to build great buildings, great palaces throughout the Middle East. In fact, any picture, any drawing that you've ever seen of the temple and the temple platform during Jesus' day, that was a construction of King Herod the Great, one of the wonders of the world, and he constructed it. Uh, King Herod the Great built a place called Masada, a, an impressive uh, fortress in the desert next to the Dead Sea. If you don't know what it is, go home and Google it. It'll blow your mind. Masada, a, a creation of King Herod the Great. Herodium, a palace where he had actually died and was buried, was at Herodium right outside of Bethlehem, Israel. King Herod was a, was a great man in that regard. But he was a horrible, vicious, vile, and paranoid man. In fact, I, I think I've told you this before, that one of the reasons that we know he was vile and, and paranoid is because he was so concerned that, um, that his wife was plotting to have him killed and put one of his sons on the throne. He had his own wife and two of his sons murdered. In fact, Caesar Augustus said of King Herod the Great, it is better, it is safer to be Herod's pig than to be one of his sons. This is the kind of guy that he was. So when you read about King Herod the Great, he is the man who, when the wise men came at the birth of Jesus, looking for this newborn king of the Jews, Herod, thinking that this would be a threat to his throne, had all of the baby boys under two years old in Bethlehem slaughtered. That was how vile and violent he was, King Herod the Great. There are four other Herods in the New Testament. Herod the Great had a son named Antipas. It was Antipas that had John the Baptist put to death. He had another son named Philip. Matthew 16 records one of the great projects of Philip. He built Caesarea Philippi. And then he had grandsons, one named King Herod Agrippa I. That's the grandson of Herod the Great. He had the apostle James killed in Acts 12. And then when you come to Acts 26, this King Herod is King Herod Agrippa II. This is the great grandson of Herod the Great. He is the one who is in view in Acts chapter number 26. Now these kings didn't have any real authority. Their authority was given to them by Rome, but they lorded over the Jewish people in a violent kind of way. Well, Paul stands before him in Acts chapter number 26. He comes to Caesarea to greet Felix. He hears about Paul and then he says, well, I want to hear Paul. So verse number 23, I'm still in chapter 25 and verse number 23. The Bible says on the next day when King Agrippa was come and Bernice, that's his sister, with great pomp and was entered into the place of the hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. You can see this scene, right? Wear the, wear the skin of the people in the text. So put yourself in Caesarea. You can, you can hear the great fanfare. The king is in town. The governor is in town. All the dignitaries are in town. There's a motorcade coming to the place where this, this uh, presentation is going to happen. The trumpets are blasting. You want sound effects? Da, 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 da. There you go. The trumpets are blasting. The banners are being waved. The king is coming in in all his royal regalia. All of the authorities are there. And the amphitheater in Caesarea is full of people and Paul is brought into speech. In fact, let me show you a picture they'll put up on the screen for you. This is the place where it happened. We don't think it is. We know it is. 
In the center of that theater, you can almost see it right in the center. There's a little open space down near the bottom. That's called the place of the hearing. It's the king's seat. That is exactly where King Herod sat. And Paul the apostle stood. We don't think we know. Paul stood on that platform with that theater full of people and the king and the governor and the chief captains and the dignitaries and the authorities. And Paul walked in before there to give a defense of the work of Jesus Christ in his life. Trial number five. Let's read about it. Verse number one of Acts chapter number 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. Standing in that theater, the apostle Paul giving his testimony. Let's pick it up in verse number 12. Verse 12 says, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, brighter than the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them that journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, the light was so bright and overwhelming, it knocked us to the ground. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for thee to resist. It's hard for you to resist me, to kick against the goads or the pricks. And I said, verse 15, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose. I'm going to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and those things which, in the which I will appear unto you. I'm delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles, and I'm going to send you now unto the Gentiles. And here's why I'm sending you, verse 18, that you might open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of their sins and in, uh, receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. Paul stands in this great amphitheater. Surrounded by these people of power and authority. These people who have, as we've talked about in the last few weeks, the ability to have him killed or to set him free. He has this opportunity to stand before them and he shares his testimony. We, we've talked about it before. He tells them, we didn't read it all, you can read it later. He tells them, this is who I was before I met Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. And this is the difference that Jesus has made. If you haven't done this yet, do this. Craft your own testimony. Get your laptop or your computer and hammer it out. Get a legal pad and write it out. Who I was before I met Jesus, how, when, where I met Jesus, and the difference that Jesus has made. And if you'll follow that model, you'll be able to share your testimony. Paul does that. But in this particular passage, he does something that he doesn't do anywhere else. Only place in the Bible he recites verbatim the commission, the vision, the command that Jesus gave him on that day. It begins in verse 16. He says that Jesus said to me, rise, stand upon your feet. I have called you to be my witness. I'm gonna send you to the Gentiles and here's what you're gonna do, verse 18. You're gonna open their eyes. You're gonna turn them from darkness to light. You're gonna turn them from the power of Satan unto God. They're gonna receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. And he recites that command ver. Them. You know, it's been almost 30 years since it happened. It's been nearly three decades since that Damascus Road experience. But when Paul tells it, it's as fresh in his heart. It's as crystal clear on this day, standing in the amphitheater, as it was 30 years ago nearly when it happened. And then he says these words, verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And by the way, when the Bible uses that literary tool, that literary tool of emphasizing what is true by presenting it in the negative. In other words, when he says, he didn't just say, I was obedient, he says, I was not disobedient. It's a form of emphatically affirming what was true. What he's saying is, I was super obedient. I was, you, you've done this, right? Or you've heard teenage boys talking, you know, where you say it in a way that really makes it emphatic. Like a teenage boy says to his buddy, they're talking about a girl and, and boy number one says, is she pretty? And boy number two says, well, she ain't ugly. 
What he means is, she's really pretty. That's exactly what Paul said. He says, I was super obedient to the command that God had given me. And I think you'll agree with me. Can't we all be thankful that Paul was obedient to the commission and the mission that God called him to? He carried the gospel throughout the Middle East. He carried it across the continent of Turkey. He took it over across the continent of Europe. And ultimately it got on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the ship and it sailed across and came to the United States. And you and I know Jesus ultimately because Paul was obedient to the vision, to the command. I want to spend my remaining time with you today talking about verse number 19. This simple truth of, of obeying the Lord's commands. Anytime you hear the word obey in the Bible, anytime you see the word obey in the New Testament, here's what it means every time. It means to hear under. You with me? To hear under. So the word means that I hear the command and I submit myself to the commander. I hear what God says and I submit myself in obedience to him. It is absolutely the simplest thing in the world. Obeying the Lord, obeying the commands of God ought to be for us the simplest thing that we could ever do. There's a wonderful illustration of this in the Gospel of John. Look at it, John chapter two, verse number five, where Jesus is gonna perform his first miracle at the marriage of Cana in Galilee. And Mary, his mother, says to the servants there, here's a simple uh, word of advice. You see it? Whatever he says to you, do it. There's the message. This could be the shortest sermon ever delivered at North Asheville Baptist Church. It's not going to be, but it could be. <laughs> because I could say to you, and be thoroughly biblical in doing so, welcome to church, whatever he says, do it. God bless you, you're dismissed. And you could go home going, hey, I heard a message from God's word today. It was thoroughly biblical. I mean, this should be so simple. Now, I get that it's not. I know that it's, it, we make it more complex than that, and circumstances seem to complicate the issues, but this ought to be very simple. And so I want to zero in and help all of us with this thing of obedience. Verse number 19, I was not dis. Obedient. Write this down, if you will. Many of you are note takers. I want you to write down the value of simple obedience. It's not complex. I don't have to figure it out. It's really easy. The value of simply obeying what God says. Did you know that from Genesis to Revelation, throughout the pages of Scripture, we are reminded of a very simple principle. It's very simple, and here it is. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings death. All right, now, I know it's complex, right? So I don't want you to get overwhelmed with this, but here we go. Let's do it again. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings death. Simplest thing you've ever heard. And this is not new information. In the earliest pages of Scripture, in fact, why don't you turn, hold your finger in Acts, we'll be back to it. Go to Genesis chapter 2, like the, like the infancy of the human family. Before God had even created Eve, it's just Adam and God. And God puts him in the garden. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, the Bible says the Lord God took the man, Adam, and he put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded, see, it's a command. The Lord God commanded Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For if you disobey this command, if you eat of that tree which I've told you not to eat of, you will surely die. Translation, Adam, if you obey me, the entire garden is yours. You can eat everything you want, all that you want of it. It's all there for you. It's all yours. If you obey me, this is yours. Don't eat this. And if you do, if you disobey me and you eat this fruit, you will die. It doesn't get much more simple than that, right? Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings death. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 3, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, I should say. The wages of sin is death. 
When we disobey, things die. When we disobey God, things in relationships begin to die. When we disobey God, things in communities, nations begin to die. When we disobey God, the vibrancy of our faith walk, the witness, the power of our witness begins to wither and die. Not our relationship with Jesus, we're saved forever, but when we sin and disobey him, that powerful witness and joy begins to die. He says, if you eat of this fruit, if you disobey me, you will die. And yet, of course, we know the story of Genesis that they did disobey and they died. Not physically, but they died, ultimately physically, but they died spiritually. Turn forward, you're in Genesis, go to Deuteronomy. So it's the fifth book of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 11, uh, because this principle had to continue to be shared to the, with the people because we continue to disobey. So in Deuteronomy 11, God speaking to the nation of Israel says in verse 26, Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. So the choice is yours. Verse 27, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside. God says, look, here's the deal. If you will obey me, here's a blessing. If you disobey me, it's a curse. Now, by the way, I, I said it's all the way through Scripture. We've looked at Genesis. We've looked at Deuteronomy. If you were to go, don't turn for the sake of time, Romans chapter 5 affirms this truth. Because Romans 5 says that even Jesus obeyed God the Father. Think about that for a minute. Who am I to disobey God when Jesus himself obeyed God the Father, even though he was equal with God the Father? Romans 5 says, wherefore by the disobedience of one, that's Adam, every person was plunged into sin. So by the obedience of one, that's Christ, so many will be made righteous. There's another principle here. If y'all are listening, say amen. amen. Listen to this. When we obey, there's blessing. When we disobey, there's death. And that principle is not an individual principle. It is, it's a shareable, transferable principle. So that when I obey God, not only do I find blessing, but the people in my circle of influence, my family and people around me, they're blessed as well by my obedience. But if we disobey God, the people around us are affected by the death that comes through our disobedience. And so the Bible says that we should know this lesson. It is clearly presented through and through. That if we will obey God, there will be blessing. And if we disobey God, then things will begin to die. But the truth is, we don't always obey God, do we? we? We fail in this regard. So many times we do what he says not to do. And you have to ask the question, why? I mean, if it's so clear and it's so simple, why do I do that? By the way, Jesus asked that same question. Look at this. Uh, the Bible says in Luke 6, 46, Jesus asked a really logical question. He said, why do you call me Lord? And you don't do what I say. That's a great question. Why do you call me Lord? The word means master. Why do you say I'm your master, but yet... You won't let me be your master. Why do you say I'm your Lord, but yet you don't obey what your Lord says? So it's a good question. So you're in Deuteronomy. We're going to keep making our way back to Acts. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel. So Deuteronomy will lead you into Joshua, Judges, and then you'll be right into uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and Kings and Chronicles. But go to 1 Samuel chapter number 15, because I think there's a great case study here uh, as to why we disobey the commands of God. Now, in 1 Samuel 15, um, uh, Saul, who is the king of Israel, has just completed a, a campaign, a battle with the Amalekites. And so here's the command, because the Amalekites were infecting the Israelites, God said, in this battle, I want no one to survive, not even the sheep and the oxen. I, I want the Amalekites wiped out, including their livestock, okay? And so they go to battle, and after the battle, Samuel, who is the, the man of God, the prophet, comes to check on how things went. Look at verse 13. I'm in 1 Samuel 13. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 15, verse 13. 
So Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Can you see this? Samuel comes walking up, Saul sees him coming, he goes, oh man, here comes God's prophet, here comes the man of God, and so he runs out to greet him and he says, welcome, blessed be the name of the Lord, I have obeyed him. We have done what the Lord said with the Amalekites. Look at the next verse, verse number 14. And Samuel said, so then what does this bleeding of the sheep mean and the lowing of the oxen? God said, I want the oxen and the sheep. I want everything dead, even the livestock. And so when Samuel comes up, Saul says, we have obeyed the command of the Lord. We've, even all the livestock are gone. And while he's saying it, in the background, there's, (laughs) He's all going, keep the sheep quiet. So Samuel says, if you obeyed the Lord, why do I hear the livestock back in the background? Now look at verse 15. This is classic. In verse 15, Saul, thinking quick on his feet, says, well, they have brought those best sheep and oxen. They spared the best of the sheep and oxen. You see this verse 15? To sacrifice to the Lord. Come on. He says, we kept those because we wanted to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Why do we do this? Why do we disobey? Here's a primary reason. I want you to see it in verse number 17. Write it down. It is to say that obedience is a mark of humility or humility indicate, uh, obedience indicates that we have a spirit of humility. Because this is what Samuel says to Saul. He says in verse number 17, and Samuel said, when you were little in your own sight. Church, listen, don't miss this. He says, when you were little in your own sight, you obeyed God and he promoted you to be the king. And now that you're the king, you're the big shot king, you got it figured out. You're walking in your pride. You think you can do what you want to do. Anybody, any parent who's ever raised a child knows this principle, that when children are very, very small, and they're completely dependent on us, they are typically very compliant. But what happens? Children begin to grow. And as they grow, they become less dependent on us for their survival. They they begin to think for themselves. They, They begin to rebel and resist. They figure it out. By the time they're a teenager, they know everything. Isn't that right? Everything. And the and, and so they grow to this place where they walk in pride and they begin to disobey because they know better. I wish I had known this when I was 22 years old and not 51 years old because I would have been a better father at 22 if I had known that the problem, that the fix for the problem is not to break their spirit. It's not to crush their spirit. It's to shepherd their heart to humility. Because if I can shepherd their heart to humility, if they'll live with humility, then they will be responsive to the commands that they're given. This is what he says to Samuel. He says, when you had humility, you you walked in obedience. And so when you look at your life, if it is marked by obedience, then you're walking in humility. And if it's marked by disobedience, then you're walking quite likely in pride. So that's the first thing. Now the second sort of life lesson out of Samuel or Saul's experience is that we need to understand, write this down, that sacrifice or worship is no substitute for obedience. Sacrifice or worship is no sub- substitute for obedience. So God said, I want all the sheep and the oxen of the Amalekites killed. And Samuel, or Saul rather, said, we're going to keep some. And then when he got called, and he said, we're going to offer these to the Lord. And I want you to look at Saul's, or Samuel's response to him in verse number 22. You ought to circle this verse, highlight it, don't ever lose it. Verse 22, and Samuel said, does the Lord have have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as he does in the obeying of the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Here's what we do. So many of us live lives that in so many ways and in so many patterns and in so many parts of our lives, we're just, can we be honest, we're just disobeying. You know, God clearly says what we are to do and how we're to respond and what his commands are, and we just, we just disobey them. And then 
We, we come before him at church or wherever else. We come before him in worship and we sing and we praise and we offer these sacrifices of praise. All the while, there's all this disobedience over here. And here's what God says. He says, you know, really what I'd prefer is that you'd just kind of be quiet and just start obeying me. Because what I would prefer is the worship of your obedience, not the worship of your song from a heart of disobedience. I mean, Jesus taught us this, didn't he? Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, if you, if you come to worship, if you come to bring your offering to the altar, and when you get there to bring your worship, you remember, oh, I've got this unresolved issue over here with my brother. Jesus said, leave your, leave your sacrifice. Stop. And go be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your worship. So never think that I can, I can live in disobedience and mask it with worship because God knows and he values obedience more than worship. Y'all still with me? Say amen. Okay. So these, this is the reason we walk in pride and then we try to cover up the disobedience. All right, so, so I, I got to move us to close. But let me ask you a specific question. I really want you to consider this. I believe that for every one of us in this room, there are very specific ways in which the Lord would say to us right now, look, this is an issue. This is where I've spoken to you. This is what my word says. This is where I have commanded you, and you are disobeying me. And God is saying, I want you to stop, and I want you to begin to obey me in that. What is it for you? It could be, it could be anything. But you know what it is. Right now, the Holy Spirit's telling you, this is it. What is it? Might be in your marriage. Maybe there's an issue going on in your marriage and your attitude or your heart or your decisions have been this and God's going, that's not what I commanded you. This is what I commanded you. Do it. It's not easy. It? Do it. But I do it. And if you will, you will find blessing. Maybe it's in your finances. God said, look, we have, you know what my word says. God, I'm scared. I can't do it. Maybe it's your, in your integrity. Maybe you've gotten caught up in this deal where you live in a half lie all the time. There's so many shades and shadows to your life and so many half truths that you tell. And God would just say, stop the lying. I've commanded you to walk in truth and integrity. Do it. Am I cutting close to home? Maybe it's with the covenant with your eyes. God has said, I've called you to purity. I've called you to have your heart set on, the, on your wife and your wife only. And you are continuing to indulge in, in delighting your eyes. Stop it. What is it? And what, it may, maybe it's, it could be a thousand other things. But whatever it is, obey him. Whatever he says to you, do it. If y'all want me to stop and say you're dismissed, say amen. No, don't really. <laughs> Obedience brings blessing. Now, go back to Acts, and we're going to wrap it up because we're out of time. But in Acts chapter number 25, I want to I close by showing you a promise. Because the principle is throughout Scripture that obedience brings blessing. But what is the, what is the promised blessing that we'll find? Let me tell you before we read these verses, there is no promise from God that if you obey him, your life will be easy. That's not the promise. He doesn't say, if you will always obey me, you'll be happy, healthy, wealthy, everything will be wonderful your whole life. It's not what he says at all. In fact, look at verse number 19. I'm in Acts 26, I'm sorry, Acts 26 and verse number 19, where he says, I was super obedient to the command of God. Verse 21, and for this reason, the Jews caught me in the temple and they went about to kill me. <laughs> So he obeyed God, but life wasn't easy, right? So God doesn't promise that it's going to be easy, but here's what he does promise. Look at verse number 22. Having therefore obtained the help of God, I continue unto this day. He's saying, I've decided to obey God, and the Jews tried to kill me. They've had a conspiracy here, a murder plot there. This is my fifth trial. They've tried to take me out, but Paul said, here 
I stand because God's sovereign protection has been over my life. I want to tell you something. Because Paul decided to obey God, he was indestructible because God was protecting him. This is the promise of God. Not that your life will be easy, but that he will have you in the palm of his hand. Didn't Jesus tell us this in the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, at the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, he gave all the commands for living in the kingdom, and then he said these words. To close the sermon, here's what he said. And so, I will liken the man that hears these words of mine and does them, obeys me. I will liken him to a man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains came, and the winds blew, and the floods rose, and and that house stood because it was on the rock. And I will liken the man who hears these commands of mine and does not do them, does it, he disobeys me. I'll liken him to a man who built his house upon the sand. And the same rains came and the same winds blew and the same floods rose. And that house fell. And great was the fall of it. Obedience, you stand. Blessing. Or disobedience, you fall. Now, let me close by answering a question that I hope you're asking. And that question is, what do you do when you've been living in disobedience? What do you do when you're sitting in this place on a Sunday morning and I'm saying to you, God's word is saying to you, if you will be obedient, you will be blessed. And if, you'll be diso- if you're disobedient, you're going to be cursed. And you say, well, I, I'm living in disobedience. What do I do? You do what Paul says, Acts chapter 26, verse number 20, but I've showed unto them I showed these things to them in Damascus and to Jerusalem and throughout the coast of Judea that they, and then to the Gentiles. Here's what he was preaching, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Pastor, what do I do? I'm in disobedience. God's spoken to my heart today. I'm living in a disobedient fashion in, in ways A, B, C, and D. What do I do? Here's, here's what you do. Number one, you repent. Repent means that you say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I changed my mind. You said it's wrong. I agree with you that it's wrong, and I turn away from it. Number two, you turn to God. Turning to God means I turn to him in faith for mercy and grace. I don't go, I'm going to quit and be better tomorrow. I'm going to be more obedient tomorrow. I'm just going to just do it. No. I say, that's wrong. I'm going to turn and repent. And then I'm going to trust in God for his grace and mercy to give me grace to live in this new way. And then thirdly, and here's a key, you're going to follow through. He says, do works meet for works that demonstrate your repentance. How many t- don't answer it loud, but how many times have you said it? That's wrong, God, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And what changes? Nothing. We live in patterns of disobedience for years, sometimes decades, and we know it's wrong, and we feel guilty about it, and we weep over it, and we say, God, I'm sorry, and life is a mess as a result of it. I've got to change. And do we change? Too often we don't. And so we repent, we turn to God, and then we follow through by the grace of God. We begin to do something differently than what we've been doing. In Matthew 21, Jesus told a parable, the parable of the two sons. He said there was a man who had two sons, and he went to the first, and he said, Son, get up, go work in my field today. And that first son said, No way. I'm not working in your field. I disobey. And then, smitten with conviction, that son said, Oh, Dad, I'm sorry. And he got up and he went. And then the father went to the second son, and he said to the second son, Son, get up. Go work in my field today. And that son said, Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Glad to do it, sir. On my way, sir. I'll work hard all day, sir. And he never went to work. And then Jesus said, Which of these two did the will of his father? I'm convinced that sitting in churches across the United States of America and across the world today are people who have read clearly and know the commands of God and we have said, yes, sir, I will do it, and we don't. And then there are those, maybe this morning, who would say, I know what God has said and I have told him up until now, no, I'm not doing it. But like that first son, if we will repent and go do it then we will find the blessing as we do the will of our Father. Amen? If you're glad God's mercies are new every single morning for his children, would you shout amen?